Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the ICF's online service from Portimao. Here in the Algarve, we've been having very hot weather and the fires have been really, really bad. But at the moment, they're under control. So we give thanks to the Lord for this and we pray that they will not be any worse this year. And I would like to just say to you today that we, we, we tend to forget that happiness doesn't come as a result of something we don't have but it is a result of rather recognizing and appreciating what we do have. And we really need to remember that, that it isn't something, we don't need to have everything in our lives, we just need to have what is necessary. Could we bow our heads and say a prayer? Dear Lord, I pray that you will bless us all with a happiness and peace in life. Lead us away from greed, anger, and hate towards love. Give us your peace, Lord. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
That's it. I'm building somewhere else. Good morning everyone. It's good to be with you again. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, as we worship you this morning, we thank you for always being there for us, for being at our side whenever we ask. Help us to step back for just a moment from this difficult world and give you our praise and offer you our prayers in our worship to you today. Please bless all those in our church family, wherever we are in the world. And we ask you to bless the leaders of all churches as they work in your name. Especially today, we ask you to bless Joy and all the work she does for your family at the International Christian Fellowship in Portimao. Though many people are suffering in this world today, either through famine, natural disaster, war, disease, or personal circumstance. Please be with them in their hour of need. We especially think of the unrest in Sri Lanka, the continuing situation in Afghanistan and in other countries, and even nearer home in Ukraine. We see, pi we see pictures on our television screens of the devastation in areas of Ukraine pictures of grieving families and of mothers both in Ukraine and Russia whose sons have gone to fight in the war and the mothers don't know if they're dead or alive. We can't imagine how they must feel. But you know, dear Lord, comfort them and please answer our prayers to stop this terrible war in whatever way only you can do. You are a God of peace. We pray for Christians living in countries where they're persecuted for their faith. Those deprived of aid which is given to others. Some are imprisoned, others are killed. Be with them, dear Lord, in desperate times of need and with the organisations trying to help them. We pray for political leaders in the world let them lead with integrity and compassion. We think of the forthcoming voting for a new Prime Minister in the UK. Please, Lord, let the right person be elected. And Heavenly Father, 
As we witness the effects of climate change in this wonderful world that you created, help us to be more aware of the things we are destroying in the way we live our lives. Here in Portugal and in other Western European countries, we pray for rain. We pray for the safety of brave, brave firefighters as they fight the forest fires in these countries. We pray for the family of the pilot in Portugal who was killed as he attempted to drop water to extinguish flames. And we can't even imagine the firefighters on the ground and the heat that they must feel from the flames. Oh dear Lord, please be with them all. We pray for those who are sick, thinking of those known to us. Help them to get well soon. And in a moment of silence, let's remember anyone known to us who are in need of your healing hands upon them. We ask you to bless their loved ones through anxious times. We also ask you to bless the doctors, nurses and carers who are working with the sick. Give them strength to continue. Oh dear Lord, we seem to ask you for so much, but we know that you hear us and will be listening to our prayers. Comfort those who are left behind after loved ones have left this world and help us to look forward to the time when we shall be reunited in your heavenly home. Finally, dear Lord, let us be thankful for each new day that we are given. Help us not to spoil it, but to welcome it with wonder, and to do at least one thing every day in your name for the benefit of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Said, your kingdom increase Shelter for fragile lives Cure for their ills Work for the craftsmen Trade for their skills Land for the dispossessed Rights for the weak Says to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain. Come change our love from a spark. Refuge from cruel wars, havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share, peace to the killing fields, scorched earth to green, Christ for the bitterness. His cross for the pain God of the poor Friend of the weak Give us compassion we pray Melt our cold hearts That tears fall like rain Come change our love From a spark to a flame Earth, oceans and streams Plundered and poisoned A future and dreams Lord, and our madness Careless 
restless greed Make us content with the things that we need God of the poor, friend of the weak Give us compassion Jerusalem. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, You must get out of here and go somewhere else, because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus answered them, Go and tell that fox, I am driving out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall finish my work. Yet I must be on my way today, tomorrow, and the next day. It is not right for a prophet to be killed anywhere except in Jerusalem. Jerusalem? Jerusalem. You kill the prophets? You stone the messengers God has sent you? How many times have I wanted to put my arms round all of your people, just as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me, and so your temple will be abandoned. I assure you that you will not see me until the time comes when you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. The sun 
Son of God given for me. My death he pays, and my death he burns, and I might live, and I might live, and so. They watched him die, despised, rejected, but all the blood he shed. This love of Christ shall flow like rivers. Come wash, wash your guilt away. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us once again for our worship service from ICF in Portimao. Let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time when we can meet together online and study your word together. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us today through your spirit. You know each of us, Lord. You know what we need to hear today. So speak to us, we pray, and help us to listen. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we saw Jesus teaching about the narrow gate into the kingdom and about the heavenly banquet that God has prepared for his people. The Jews all assumed that they would be the exclusive honored guests at the banquet and that all Gentiles or non-Jews would be shut out. Well, Jesus shocked them when he said that the guest list didn't work that way, that some who were first would be last and that some who were last would be first. The Jews 
thought that they were first on God's guest list and that the Gentiles were so far down that they would never make it. However, Jesus taught that the criterion for entering the kingdom of God was not racial background nor religious heritage, but simply repentance and faith in him. Now, we can imagine that this must have not only shocked, but also angered the Jewish religious leaders. We notice that any time Jesus exposes their hypocrisy or false teaching, or he breaks one of their traditions, they become irate and start to oppose him. And so in our reading today, the opening words at that very time are significant. It was right after Jesus gave this radical teaching that there would be Gentiles in the kingdom of heaven that some Pharisees told him he should leave the area because Herod was out to kill him. Now, it is possible that these Pharisees were some of the few uh, who genuinely loved God and who were receptive to the message of Jesus. We know there were some because Nicodemus was one and Joseph of Arimathea was another. Um, and if it had been Pharisees such as them, then yes, we can understand that they would be concerned for his welfare. But sadly, uh, Pharisees such as those two were few and far between. Uh, so it's probably not the case. It's more likely that these Pharisees who came to Jesus represented the majority group who had been offended by Jesus' teaching and wanted an excuse to get rid of him. It could be that the tale about Herod was a trick and was simply made up by the Pharisees to scare Jesus out of Perea and Galilee. That was the area where Herod ruled and to move him on to Judea where religious leaders would have more power over him. Or it could be that some of the Pharisees went to Herod Antipas and made a formal complaint against Jesus and deliberately aroused the king's jealousy that there was someone in his territory who was a more popular leader than he was. That would be quite in keeping with Herod's character for him to react that way. Uh, since they knew that Herod had been intimidated by John the Baptist and had killed him right there in Perea, uh, they were perhaps hoping for a similar reaction from Herod towards Jesus. And maybe they were in fact successful in arousing Herod's fear and hostility. If so, the Pharisees would have been only too glad to deliver the warning to Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him too. At the very least, they hoped that it would give Jesus and his followers a good reason to move on and to stop bothering them and leave them in peace. Another possible scenario is that King Herod independently saw Jesus as a threat to his power in Perea and Galilee, and that it was his idea to summon the Pharisees to be his pawns to try and frighten Jesus away by using death threats, but without actually having to kill him. Everyone knew Herod was responsible for the death of John the Baptist, uh, but maybe he thought, well, to kill two prophets so soon, one after the other, that might make him unpopular with the people. Uh, so maybe he used the Pharisees to be his pawns to try and get rid of him by fear. We don't know exactly what happened, but the message <clears throat> that Jesus gives for the religious leaders to take back to Herod suggests that the Pharisees and King Herod are somehow all in league with each other. All of them want Jesus to leave the region. So first of all, we're going to look at Jesus' reply to this warning. Jesus replies, go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow and on the third day I will reach my goal. Now to the Jews, a fox had three main characteristics. He was the craftiest of animals. He was also the most destructive of animals. And he was also a symbol of a worthless and insignificant person. Well, in essence, Jesus is saying that Herod is all three. He's crafty, 
he's destructive but he's actually insignificant in the danger that he poses now in Jesus's reply we notice three qualities about him first of all we see here that Jesus was fearless he had no fear of Herod the king's father Herod the Great had already tried his best to kill him uh, when Jesus was a baby and he failed Jesus knew that he was completely safe in his heavenly father's hands and so he replied with great calm I'm reminded of his words to his followers in Luke 12 4 don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more but I will show you who to fear fear him who after the killing of the body has the power to throw you into hell yes I tell you fear him and secondly we see that Jesus was faithful he took his instructions from the king of heaven not from any earthly monarch he refused to rush his time in Perea short or to cut short the work that his father had called him to do he would go on driving out demons and healing people there in Perea just as he had before to alleviate human suffering and to validate his preaching through his words and through his miracles Jesus taught and showed that he really was the promised Messiah people could trust him they could believe in him because he had authority from God and then thirdly we see that Jesus was far-sighted he continues in any case I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem the cross was always in front of Jesus in his mind he had come into the world to die but he wouldn't do so at the hands of wicked men like Herod he would give his life of his own accord Matthew 20 28 says the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and in John 10 17 he says the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again no one takes it from me I lay it down of my own accord the reason that Jesus would eventually leave Perea and go on to Jerusalem had nothing to do with the wishes of the Pharisees or the threats from Herod Jesus was going to Jerusalem simply because it was his mission in life to save each of us and God had ordained that his sacrifice would take place there in Jerusalem in a public way so that all people might know about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world ever since Caesarea Philippi Jesus had spoken openly with his disciples about his approaching death in Luke 9 22 he said the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders chief priests and teachers of the law he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life this could only happen in Jerusalem the city already stained with the blood of the prophets it was only fitting that the greatest prophet of all the Son of God himself should die there too and so we see a calm serenity in Jesus's reply he's fearless in the face of danger although Herod may be close at hand he's faithful to do his father's will in Perea how long ever long that might take and he is far-sighted looking beyond the present time to the cross where he will give his life for us Herod would not change Jesus's course by one mile or by one minute the Son of God would stay on track and do what he came into this world to do in God's way and in God's time I pray that we too would be fearless faithful and far-sighted as Jesus was and follow in his steps and do our utmost to carry out the Father's will 
for our lives. In the words of Hebrews 12.1, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what And laid behind the stone You lived to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before.
and now we're going to look at the second part of our text, Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. As Jesus looks ahead to Jerusalem and the cross, his heart breaks into a lament for the people who he loves so much, yet who continue to reject him. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he begins, his words filled with great tenderness. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. The people never seem to learn from their mistakes, but keep on committing the same tragic errors again and again. God has given them so many opportunities to turn back to him, but they continue to reject him. When will they ever learn? Jesus' words remind us of the prophet Hosea, who spoke of God's great love for Israel. Hosea 12 verse 1 reads, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. But my people are determined to turn from me. As Jesus saw the unbelief and rebellion all around him, it grieved him deeply. He knew that it would lead to disaster for the nation. If only they would turn back to God, he could rescue them. He continues, How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Just as a mother hen gathers her chicks together when she senses danger approaching, God longed to rescue and redeem his people, but they had to be willing to accept his help. This image of a mother bird is often used in scripture to represent God's protective love for his people. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 10 we read, In a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries him on his pinions. And in Psalm 91 verses 1 and 4 we read, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Here in Luke 13 we have a lament of great pathos. Jesus loved the city of Jerusalem. He had come here many times for the three annual feasts, ever since he was a boy of 12. He had worshipped in the temple, debated with the religious leaders, healed the blind and lame, taught the people in the temple courts. He loved all of them. He loved the nation that this city represented. And yet, in many ways, it was an unrequited love. He knew that the people's rejection of his offer of salvation would lead to great destruction and suffering. It was as if a bird of prey were hovering over the city, about to swoop down and destroy it, and he longed to protect it, to save it. But the people refused. The problem wasn't the willingness of Jesus to rescue the people. It was their unwillingness to be rescued. In AD 70, the siege of Jerusalem would take place. And most of the city, including the temple, would be completely destroyed by the Romans. And perhaps as many as a million people would be brutally killed. Jesus' words would sadly come true. Their house would be left desolate. Everything they loved, their homes, their city, their temple, would all be burned to the ground. And yet, Jesus' final words offer a ray of hope in the darkness. He says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
This is a quote from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, which reads, O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, it partly refers to Palm Sunday, which would take place in the near future, when at least for a short time the people would sing these words and welcome Jesus as their Messiah. But it also refers to his second coming, when every eye will see him, and when the descendants of the present Jews will acknowledge that Jesus is indeed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so the ray of hope Jesus offers us is that whenever people will humble themselves and say, Lord, save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then they will see Jesus for who he really is, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this portion of scripture that we've studied today. Thank you, Lord, for your great love for your people, not just for Jerusalem, not just for Israel, but for every country in this whole world. You love each of us. And Lord, you long to rescue us. You long to save us. And Lord, thank you for your example, how in the face of danger, you were fearless. You trusted in your heavenly Father. You were faithful to carry out his mission that, that he gave you in the world. And you were far-sighted. You looked ahead to the cross and what you had to do. And Lord, I pray that as we follow you, you'd help us to, to be fearless, not to be afraid of other people and what they think. Help us to be faithful, to follow you in the way that you lead us, and to be far-sighted, to have our eyes fixed on you and fixed our, on our home in heaven that you've prepared for us. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to walk in your steps and be faithful, fearless, and farsighted as you were. In your precious name we pray. Amen. One